Hi there Hi and there. welcome to the Untold Radio. And uh, this Network? is down south. Yeah, I got that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> down south and almost always that black bit throws me. I told you there's a few seconds And my wife, of black. Aspasia, yep. and yep. we have, I know I say this every program, but we have a profound guest today, someone we're truly excited to be in the company of, and someone who's been working, well, extensively with other researchers on one of the most meticulous sites, mm. data information terminals for Yowie sightings, Bigfoot sightings in Australia. It is Sarah okay. Bignall, mm -hmm. and uh, she is part of Australian Yowie Research and yowiehunters.com, which I believe is the sine qua non of all Bigfoot research mm. in terms of the information provided and how meticulously those interviews go up mm -hmm. on that site. They go up with topographical maps. And also, she's someone I totally admire for her incredibly patient and non-leading interview technique. It just floors me mm -hmm. every time. So, Sarah, welcome to Down South Anomalies. And sorry about that shaky start. <laughs> no, that's all good. It's okay. It's so lovely to be here with you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, anything, any opportunity to talk about my favourite subject is is welcome. Well, I'd love right. to know why this became your favourite subject. And how. <laughs> and and your history with coming to this research. And I think you've been with Australian Yowie Research for just a short term in terms of your interest in the subject. So maybe I'll just step back and you tell us about it. Okay. So I guess I've, I've always been interested in, um, in the invisible world around us, in entities and beings and trolls and goblins and fairies and uh ghosts and and of course bigfoot because that's that's my my main passion uh as a child all i read were lots and lots of books enid blighton you know uh the narnia series mm. all that all that fantasy world stuff it, it just has always drawn me and i remember as a child being bitterly disappointed when I started to understand, or I started being told, as an uh, you know, as you get older, that those things don't exist, that 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 they're it's just imaginary, it's fantasy. You've got to grow up and and into the real world, and and I always resented that. I, I was always really, uh, I always was quite disappointed. But then uh, I guess in my spare time, so for you know, seventeen years approximately, I, I I've always read books on Bigfoot. I remember seeing that incredible Patterson Gimlin footage uh, when when I was a, a young girl um, that you know that the most famous uh, American footage that we have of, of Bigfoot mm -hmm. and I remember yeah that's the one that's Patty yep. and I remember watching that and just being hypnotized mesmerized by this being and so for many years I, I researched I listened to um, you know, programs and read books. And then with, when the internet started, I, I was researching and listening to podcasts and all sorts of things on, um, on, on Bigfoot and Sasquatch in the United States. And it was only, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe about 10 years ago or so, a little, maybe a little bit more, but, but certainly not right at the beginning. When I was in my thirties, I discovered that there was an Australian version of Bigfoot that we actually had them here and and I was like what the I've never heard <laughs> of this before uh nobody ever told me this when I was well, when I was a little girl that we had these beings we have all sorts of entities and beings here in Australia as well uh because it, the, the you know that that uh, if we're starting to talk about beings that can travel interdimensionally then it doesn't really matter where you are on the planet if one country's got them other countries are going to have them too uh and so it's sort of graduated into vampires and werewolves and uh the twilight series and and then the true blood series and and all of those those books that i was fascinated by um it it wasn't until and all of this time, you know, I, I, I was working as a, I spent many years in Spain, but then I went to, came back to Australia and started work as a, as an English teacher. And that led into social work after the Black Saturday bushfires. Right. And so in that job, it, it, well, several 
several different social work jobs over over several years, working with bushfire affected people, working with homeless people in 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 Melbourne, working with very naughty young teenagers, young offenders, and children in out of home care and the child protection system, and uh, and then victims of violent crime, which was a really heavy duty job supporting family members of of homicide victims and. Uh, mm you know, p- people who were dealing with childhood sexual assault and really heavy, heavy stuff. And so I, I got to the point where I was, uh, and I wasn't in a really good place. There was a bit of bullying going on in, in this workplace and um, I, I just I needed a break. And uh, my husband said to me, why don't you just take take some time off, chill out, just de- de-stress, get, get that mental health back again And so I did that and I just did nothing for 12 months. I was very lucky, very fortunate to be able to do that. But then I started getting bored and a friend of mine who did a a show on the local radio station on Main FM in Castlemaine said to me one afternoon, do you, can you come in and be a co-host with me? Because I, I, um, my usual co-host is away sick, come in and talk about anything you like. And I was like, oh, okay, I've never been on radio before. I've no idea. What can I talk about? Oh, yeah, the one thing that I spend most of my free time reading about and researching was the Yowies and Bigfoot and Sasquatch. So I got on the radio and had a bit of a chat about that and she said to me afterwards, you have to do a show on this. This is fantastic stuff. This is really interesting. you got to do a show. And, and Main FM gave me the opportunity to do that and taught me how to use the radio console and and uh, minimal minimal training I, I was really thrown in the deep end to a certain extent but but in a, in a good way it it uh i learnt fast and all of a sudden mm. i was doing this weekly radio show on yowies and sort of other phenomena but basically it was to introduce the local community my local community about this subject mm. so starting to interview witnesses and uh, other researchers, um, I contacted Dean Harrison and thinking, oh, he's just going to blow me off. By that stage, I'd contacted a few people and I was struggling to get anybody to cover my show. And and so I contacted Dean and I must have caught him on a good day because he just he actually doesn't really like being interviewed. And I caught him on a good day and he we just hit it off, got on like a house on fire. And he, not long after that, somebody reported to him that they'd seen a Yowie looking in their bathroom window right. near me uh, down in Dales, near Dalesford, um, which is not too far from where I live in Castlemaine. Uh-huh. So um, I asked if I could go down and, and check it out and talk to her. And, and so I did an interview with her and it, 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 was, it went really well and he was really pleased. And all of a sudden he started sending me more and more um reports that we had coming in and and all of a sudden I started just taking over and doing all the witness interviews for AYR so that's what I've been doing for the last three years so have you been do you do this full-time yeah pretty much you've got a day job okay no no no, Mm -hmm. yeah go on Jamie yeah. No, I, I just think that's extraordinary and that's incredibly exciting. And we should have mentioned Dean's name up front because I believe that Dean has created what, you know, over the last 27, 28 years is probably the most groundbreaking uh, research site in the Yowies in the country. It was the very no, first true. collective <laughs> site. Um, there he is. Uh, and God is he. Look at that. Just like he's just a poster Isn't he child. Gorgeous? For, for the action. He is gorgeous. He's, he's, he's a man stunning. of action. But, but look, let's seriously get to this yeah, point yeah. because yeah. I, I, I believe you were the first site on the internet into this research that started to tally this incredible amount of sightings. And the one thing is, in the singularity of these one to one sightings we have with eyewitnesses it's easy to dismiss it but mm-hmm. once you start to see the totality of the information you mm-hmm. put up there it does paint a picture of what you spoke about before a parallel world that has not been addressed in mainstream media and is quite a, a shock to all of us and i believe now you've got well over a thousand eyewitness accounts how many would you have on the youtube site there are, I think at last count, there's 180 or so videos. Um, and the videos are the recorded interview that we do. So everyone mm-hmm. who sends us in 
a sighting, a Yowie sighting, I contact them and I interview them on the phone and I talk to them from anywhere between half an hour to two hours. And Dean then um, neatens that up a bit and, and edits it, edits it to the point where it just it all fits together and makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then he he creates this beautiful video together with illustrations uh, created by Buck Buckingham, who's our, our CGI artist and, and very integral part of the AYR team. So, so what you've had there, you've had a real is embryonic. That the team? Is that the uh, team there? That's the team. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's wow, where we missed the way. Yeah, it's beautiful. So you've, we've, there's me and we've got Buck at the back and we've got Gary and Shannon and Steve That's and there's cool. also Wade yeah. and Al yeah. who are missing Buck from that back. as well. Yeah. All yeah. yeah. oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're missing two of us Great there. Shot. Okay. And that, do you all live like spread out? So the, the boys, all the most, the boys all live in Queensland. All oh, right. Okay. And, uh, most of them are, are centred around the Gold Coast, um, mm-hmm. and then but I'm down in Victoria, so I don't get to go out field researching with them as often as I would like. Right. Mm-hmm. I have made it up there three times this year, um, and hopefully in January I'll be able to to head up and go out field researching with them. I think okay. what I was trying to say before is I've noticed this evolution that has been really profound in terms of getting those eyewitness interviews to a point of absolute incredible integrity and artistic. They're so beautiful. And I mean, to start off with, it is so important that people see the geographical area that these are occurring in for many reasons. And I think from a research perspective, it's astounding to have so much information freely given to the public. But the other thing is, too, it's really important to people that are looking into this subject matter that they can identify an area they're going into where an event like this could occur and in many ways be prepared for this this happening. And then to see you bring in something as extensive as CG and animation, which literally brings that interview to life. But the most brilliant thing, and I think Dean had this as an interviewer as well, is that, you know, in the years and years of research we've done into a whole spectrum of anomalous activity, one of the most dangerous things is to lead people in Mm. terms of that interview. And you both step back and let that interviewee state the story without leading them at all. And also, I think there is the trauma and the shock. Both of us have that background in mental health. And we can see that people that it's a life changing experience. Mm, mm. It might be very short, the experience, but it is never forgotten. It becomes predominant. And I do hear signs in the audio testimony of post traumatic mm. stress yeah. quite regularly. Yeah. Yep. So I think what you're also providing, even just with that interview testimony, is this cathartic release, this incredible release to share their story, to not feel alone, but to also have someone at the other end that's that shows so much empathy mm. and understanding, is that you're actually providing an incredible mental health service. Absolutely. And there was a real um, a real need. For it. That's what I discovered when I started re- started interviewing people, and with my training, I, I, I started recognizing those those signs of, of PTSD, of, mm-hmm. of trauma, and and so many people carry this heavy burden of a secret that something that was completely life changing, uh, paradigm changing, shattering, mind blowing, <laughs> mind blowing, like all those extra <laughs> adjectives mm-hmm. you can think of, because it was. Uh, it, it was. It was. You end up ca- carrying this thing around, and you try to tell people, and people either laugh at you, they mock you, they call you crazy, or they roll their you. eyes, mm, they dismiss mm. you. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and so, most of the people I talk to either haven't told anyone, or they might have told one or two people in their close circle and and got a bad reaction, and have just then kept it to themselves forever after that. Mm. Um, mm. So it's, yeah, absolutely, Jamie, the, 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 and the, the signs of trauma are there and you can hear it in their voice. You can hear the, the residual fear mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 20, 30 years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And that, you know, you don't get post-traumatic stress disorder from fantasy. an hallucination <laughs> or a nightmare. Or a fantasy. Or a yeah. fantasy. Yeah. It just doesn't occur. Mm. The other thing which denotes incredible integrity in your research group is the mere fact of what you stated before. Dean is not there for publicity. He certainly doesn't feel that comfortable doing interviews, but he is so literate and erudite when he's interviewed and has so much knowledge that he is like a worthy interviewee and we need to get him at some stage. But I really respect that because primarily I think that I feel what you're trying to do is actually educate the public through this storm of corruption of the way that we perceive the world. And you're also challenging science out there because you are getting incredible results. And recently, you actually managed to get thermal footage that's quite astounding, which is what this is about. And people can actually go up and have a look at at this online, which takes us closer to mainstream actually beginning to accept this and bringing science on board. Absolutely, yeah. If you haven't seen that that footage, definitely go to our YouTube channel and check it out. Uh, quite remarkable. I've actually been to the very spot where they were a few times now. And let me tell you, in the middle of the night, in the dark, in the rainforest, when you're by yourself, it's really scary. And the thought of Buck being there, miraculously managing to get these two beings on camera was was quite just so remarkable um it's it's some of the best footage in the world really so what's uh, the site for people who want to go to it and have a look at it it's so you on can youtube go to, on youtube it's australian mm-hmm. if you if you put into youtube australian yowie research or ayr you'll find yeah. it so our expedition files right and you can also find all of those videos, there's a link to them on our website, on the AYR website, the Yowie Hunters website. Yeah. 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 And I think it's yowiehunters.com on YouTube. That's what I've always punched in. And I've, okay. I yes. love that start music. It's uh, <laughs> it's a little more effective than our one. But anyway. Well, um, it's funny, the music, because I, I don't like it at all. And Dean, everybody loves it. And, and there's a few people who really don't like it and thinks it's, I think it's really dated and I'd love to get some different music. But Dean's like, no way, love the music. I think actually <laughs> his, his brother might have. Uh, written that music especially for him so right. he's emotionally he's entangled in it yeah fair enough yeah. uh look oh, God, where I mean, do we, where so do we start with this <laughs> look one thing i want to get in there is just to humanize this and uh I'm, I'm we're so grateful for you to do this interview and i know you've been through some trauma recently but you've bounced at back because you love roller skating Yes. <laughs> yes, I've just been skating this morning. It was awesome. We had a master class on and we had this figure skater there who was teaching us some tricks. So it was really oh, so fun. It's ice, ice skating, is it? You do ice well, skating? No, roller skating. But roller skating. skating. Okay. There is yeah, actually yeah. Figure, figure skating ro- in okay. roller skating as well. Yes, 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 um, yes. So mm-hmm. we, we usually do a mix of jam sk- dance moves and, and uh, figure skating tricks and, and basic stuff. So it was really fun. Okay. That is great to hear. And, you know, this film, Roller Boogie, it needs a digital release. It, 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 it's never had that. Happens. And it stars Linda Blair. Linda Blair. From The Exorcist. Oh, yes. 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 I, mean, there are I don't think it's had a proper digital I release. I think there was some sort of a problem with um, the some of the music. There was copyright, you know, at the time when right. they used it and then it went out of copyright or something and, and they just, you know, that was the last time I looked. But I don't know, maybe things have changed since then. So who knows? But look it up. Check it out. Now, has your husband... Sorry, go on. Go on. I was going to say, I think there are snippets of that movie on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a trailer in that. Yeah. 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 And uh, look, as soon as we know that the second version of that is being rebooted, (laughs) we're going to actually give all your details to the producers. So uh, (laughs) there you go. I'd love to see you in that. Anyway, look... (laughs) <laughs> Tell us about your husband. How does he deal with this? Because this is another part of the trauma that people suffer is the difficulty in articulating something that's got so much ridicule around it to their partners, their family members, their friends. Especially it's if they're not in it, into it, you know. So yeah. how, how's the hubby feel about it all? He's great. He When he, when I first started talking, we, we've been together 10 years now. So when, mm. when I first started talking about this stuff, 
he was like, mm, <laughs> you're a bit weird. <laughs> but luckily, he, he does actually have he, his his parents, his grandmother and mother were quite spiritual people. So right. he's not completely um, unaware of that invisible right. world, mm-hmm. that spiritual right. world. So yeah. it wasn't a it, it wasn't a, a massive leap. But he did think I was a bit weird. Uh, but but now he's he's really he loves listening to the stories. He 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 definitely critiques me on my intros and outros for my show and um no he's really good he's very supportive uh he's building me a studio i'm in my my lounge room at the moment but he's building me a studio so he's very wonderful that's wonderful and that's great that that is embraced you know it's remarkable that we have this sort of contradiction here we have these incredible things that are literally they're right in front of our face and yet we have this culture where there is just so much corruption mm-hmm. and contamination mm-hmm. about how to go about researching, telling, being aware of them. How have you dealt with that? I mean, it's something that it's a day-to-day occurrence with us mm. still. And it's amazing. We were up in Dural on the weekend. We were. And uh, we actually took part of Asper's um, Greek um family from Lesbos all up there. Yep. We went Uh, fruit picking. Yeah, it's amazing (laughs) to see (laughs) see 80, 90 year old women with four layers of black clothing on in the searing heat (laughs) picking nectarines. It's like, can you believe this? But they're tenacious. I asked there about the Min Min Light and Yowie sightings and I was literally laughed off the property by virtually everyone there. They Mm. hadn't heard of the Min Min Light. No. They thought the Yowie was ridiculous. And then they told me they hear a lot of wild boars smashing around at night. And I said, do you see them? Are they wild boars? And then I said, get prepared. (laughs) You're about to be challenged. Your mind think. Yeah. And so how do you do it? You know, to me, it's a profound conundrum that the proletariat, the working class person without a scientific background has ended up doing something that the CSIRO or the National Parks and Wildlife should be showing, doing. well, they're showing major dereliction of duty here, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> especially in the fact that all this anomalous phenomena can have moments, whether they're accidental or incidental, where they're, they're very dangerous. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I, I reached a point where I stopped caring what mainstream Mm. society thinks about this subject if you it's not my job to convince you it's not my job to show you evidence Mm -hmm. I it is my my role and my mission to collate and collect that evidence for AYR and it Mm -hmm. is my role to support witnesses of these beings and to give them the emotional support they need and um, to share this knowledge with people who are interested Mm -hmm. I don't I'm not really uh that fast with sharing it with people who don't who aren't seeking me out Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate now as I have a um an amazing circle of of friends who are all interested in this Mm -hmm. uh some of them are down here in Victoria the vast majority of them don't live in my state but I have you know messenger chats constantly all day every day with people who uh who are like-minded people so I actually to a certain extent live in a little bit of a bubble uh, mm-hmm. And where I know a lot of people who are into into this, and so I don't necessarily discuss this with other people. Um, but I do. I mean, I did go to my high school reunion uh, a few months ago, <laughs> a thirty year high school reunion, and uh, and there were there were quite a few strange looks. Everyone was really uh, no one was laughing in a nasty way, but they mm-hmm. were all kind of what the <laughs> what right what? yeah. Um, they all thought it was quite a little bit strange, but not not. Too strange much. is not the word. It should be. It should dawn on them. There should mm. be a realization that it's incredibly profound and courageous of you to actually step forward and do something against mainstream thought. Because one day, in the not too distant future, we're aware that the reality of this is going to come to fruition. And I've felt that yeah. with the UFO subject in 2019 yeah. when I went on the seven late night news bulletin, the latest, mm-hmm. with Don Schmidt, all of a sudden there was no longer the X-Files theme underneath me. There was not savage editing. There was not laughter. 
there was a realization that this person being interviewed is incredibly literate about their subject matter and there could be a possibility to this phenomena being a reality. And I felt that change. It was a remarkable mental and physiological moment for me after years and years. Of being scoffed at. Well, I mean, <laughs> my parents believed I was just Don Quixote. I'm going to be perpetually tilting at windmills and this is some fancy-filled folly. I was also drawn to it from an artistic perspective and of how expansive this is for one's imagination. And that's where I think we lose a lot. Mm. Children are so open to this phenomena intuitively and we need to retain an essence of that to be aware that this is a far more malleable and mystical world that we are part of. It can only add to the wonder of life. And, and, you know, what mm. we try to do with what you're doing is a way of adding to that wonder but also reducing that fear, reducing that trauma because we've been told it isn't real. Now, one thing about Yowie Hunter's research is that you guys have recorded cases dating, dating right back to the birth of the colony. Maybe tell us about the number of cases and how far they go back. So they go back to... Um... If I remember correctly, mid 1800s. Uh, actually, I had a, a lovely conversation with Gary Opit, who does a show on ABC Radio in the Northern Rivers area every Saturday morning. He's a wildlife Australian wildlife expert, uh, and he, you know, you could tell him, "I saw this bird, and it was brown, and it had white spots there, and it sounded like this." And he'll go, "Oh yeah, that's the the wampu Absolutely. pigeon from so yeah." He's really, mm. really, uh, really clever man so he's done a lot of research on on how far these reports go back and um yeah mid 1800s we've got most of those those old reports on our website too mm -hmm. um so you had early settlers invaders however you want to call them but early people white europeans arriving in australia and reporting seeing gorillas um mm. ape-like beings um some of them reported actually having a bit of a muzzle like a baboon like being but there there are definitely definitely stories of early explorers early white european explorers coming across ape men is how hairy they men hairy, hairy men, men. Hairy, and, men. And hairy men and also uh speaking to original australians mm -hmm. finding out that they also had stories and names for these beings all over the country mm -hmm. uh, there, there are different original Australian names for the Yowie. Uh, so, so those early reports um, just tie in with all the reports that we've got now, really. Uh, right. And you, if you think about it, 1850, mm. the, you know, the, the, there wasn't, there's no internet, there's, there's not widespread newspapers, nothing. there's nothing. So yeah. had, had the gorilla actually been discovered then? Because I know the gorilla was actually a really late discovery yeah. Um, so I don't know if they would have been saying gorilla, but and they I would think, have seen, I oh, think I have a, yeah, yeah. I, I'd have to double check what the wording mm. is. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. I think your reports do go back to, I remember Dean stating they do go back to the 1700s and they were dismissed by the colonists. Oh, they would have been. And at this point in time, I should acknowledge, because I missed out, oh, that we yeah. are on stolen land, both of us here, <laughs> and we're on the Gadigal of the Inora Nation and we Your pay our respect yeah. to them. And I tell you what, that's another point of inquiry is – we had Matt Pohl on recently. Now, Matt is the Indigenous curator at the Maritime Museum, and he was an Indigenous curator at the museum at the City the University. The Museum, yeah. In, yeah in and we Sydney spoke Union. about the reality of these things with him, and I think it's really important to get the Indigenous perspective. Mm -hmm. But as white Australians, dating back to, you know, I've got convicts in my family that probably only just stole a loaf of bread and oh, still seeing as criminals. Much. But... <laughs> <laughs> but it's really important that without, with absolute respect, that we actually try and find Indigenous people that can articulate these stories to us as well because they are predominant in the Indigenous community. Mm. They're just not something they share with the, yeah. the greater community. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I can talk about that in a sec, but I've just looked up in my notes. So when I spoke mm. to Gary, he said the first report that we have is from 1827. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's a Captain Peter Cunningham, and he mm -hmm. 
refers to uh, the, the Putikin, P U T T I K A N, and that was one of the names for Hairy Man. The next right. report was 1830 um, by an Alexander Harris, who was a, an, an immigrant. And the next one was 1841 in the Punch newspaper, an Australian gorilla. So there's the mention of gorilla oh, in right. 1841. Okay, mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so there's, yeah, there's multiple 1842, 1847, 1848. Right. 49, yeah. 46, yeah. So, and they're so, just the ones that got reported. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's, <laughs> there's would be so many reports. There still are. There mm. are thousands of reports out there. We get hundreds of them every year. So mm. they come, they're pouring in all the time, every week, all year round for the last. So are they, are they, uh, when you collate all this information, does it go somewhere to, that, that it's stored yeah. at? Uh, so Dean, Dean, um, Dean has incredible files, mm-hmm. uh, and he's got a meticulous. He's meticulous at, at documenting and them things properly. So if you say, right. "Oh, Dean, somebody mentioned something to me about uh, Yowies that have, um, you know, red eye shine," can you tell? And he'll go. He just goes into his files and goes searches right. for them, and he he'll send you then a list of all the cases that talk about that. He's, he's right. really mm-hmm. good. Uh, so we have. The, all the information that comes into us, we then put it. He then puts it up on the database, which is right. at the on the Yowie Hunters website, mm-hmm. um, and and there you'll find listed by state right. um, all the Yowie sighting, all the Yowie sighting reports that we have by state, and we've mm-hmm. also got a, um, a historical newspaper articles, historical documents. There's a photo section with track footprints and uh, all that. So you'll find there's so much material on that Yowie right. Hunters website. Yeah. There. And that's incredible. And that's freely accessible to the public, which is an extraordinary archive and extraordinary correct, resource. Extraordinary you know? yeah. resource. Absolutely. And you know, you must be doing something right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you've been recognized by our national archives in this country. Yes. And that resource is going to be taken as a piece of historical work. In perpetuity. It's there, it's they, it gets updated every six months. So it's all on trove on the on the National Library. Um, right. Okay. So how do they? How do they? You know, what's their thinking on that? Obviously, if they're uh, putting up an archive of sightings of, let's say, hairy men, then obviously it must be it must register on their. You know. Yeah. I'm 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 not sure because I I don't deal with them myself and it's right. it's been dealing with them but yeah it, it it's. The police know about it. The army knows oh. about it. The government knows about it. The forestry the, workers know about the it. The rangers know all yeah. about it. Um, yeah. It's in military handbooks. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Different reports of people <laughs> saying that they had information given to them when they joined the army about these things. Yeah. So officially, it doesn't exist, but unofficially, mm. it certainly it does. does. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what I say to people when they go, <laughs> and if they scoff at me, I just say to them, if they go camping. I say, if you're walking in the woods with a bunch of people, don't be at the front and don't be at the back. <laughs> be in the middle. Yes. <laughs> that's, and well, I say it to the grandkids too. Don't be at the front. Don't be at the back. Always be in the middle. The thing if they're is, they're going to grab you. You know, you got, it'll be it'll be the person at the back. It'll be. So, that's right. That's the right. The thing is, it, it's what I do try and do is, I, they're not as you're not in as much danger as no. you think. No, so. I know. If, if you can, if you consider the amount of sightings that we have compared to the very small number of missing people mm-hmm. reports and, and yeah. you know, the, and mysterious deaths, mm-hmm. there, there aren't that many attacks on human beings going on, yeah. if any, very few. You might get the odd bad yowie, but mm-hmm. I, honestly, the scariest thing is that you – were taught that they don't exist and then yes, you're seeing that something is. that your psyche is telling you that it is a monster. And then your brain you're doesn't high. register. Yeah. Your brain's you looking know, at I it think, and going, it doesn't. I think what is the this? corruption of popular culture too yes. in all the genres of film and television always sells the fear factor. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, all the reality-based shows that we've watched in, you know, chasing Bigfoot mm. and then you, you all, every commercial break, you get the cry out and then you realise they've stepped on a twig the wrong way <laughs> and we're back to the next segment. It's incredibly frustrating, but it's contaminated and corrupted our consciousness. Yes. And we should be aware of the bigger picture here. 
and you, your research team would be well aware of how difficult it is to even trap something that's native to that piece of geography on a trail camera. The animal world is far much more perceptive of the infrared, the ultraviolet spectrum, sound. You know, you go and place something in their environment and someone's just ruined the lounge room. I'm not going near that thing. And, yeah. you know, it, it takes a long time to find species on the border of extinction. You can have trail cameras in situ for decades and you don't, before you, don't you get them. an image. Yeah, yeah. No. So you think they're seeing infrared. That's why. They can they mm. can detect infrared light. Yes. So yeah. they don't get they never get caught by trail cams. But you know, the most incredible thing here, and there are incredible DNA studies that have been done, and we're getting closer and closer to that point. But if you just use your common sense to go, this is a parallel hominid. It has consciousness, but it probably has an adrenal cortex that can go into operation far more rapidly than ours can. It has heightened senses of the animal world. It has intuitive senses. This being has completely got it all over us. And we're going in there and destroying its natural habitat. Exactly. Uh, so we are nothing in comparison to the power of this being. And in a way, that summates what you were saying before, that we should be seeing a lot more disturbing encounters than what we do. And just like when you're out there in the wilderness and you're in an environment that human beings are actually, we need to terraform everything. It's quite extraordinary how alien we are to our own environment. And that's a whole other debate for another <laughs> podcast. But... Um, uh, you know, we are so alien to that environment. And here is something with all those heightened resources that really wants to just avoid us. And it's usually when you have an incident in the wilderness to do with wildlife, you've actually stumbled onto a moment that's not your normal moment out there. You've stumbled onto a moment where the environment's been altered, the food has been taken away, there's something rogue, there's disease there. Or some, or someone's gone into a really, um, you know, uh, isolated area where humans don't normally inhabit and that's why they're kind of not expecting a human to be there. Well, they haven't like, paid attention to well, the environment. And know. that's, let's get to this other question, you know, there are incredible markers for us. And, oh, and uh, I think here's an important point you, you're probably totally aware of. How can you discount the world's leading primatologist, Jane Goodall, who said we need to respect every Indigenous culture on the planet and every single Indigenous culture has a cultural template that place these hominids into that template? How can you debate with that human well, being you, yeah. to begin with? And that is such a respectful notion. I know from my wife's history, culturally, a lot of the things that now we deem could be reality are treated like folklore and myth mm. and in a way denigrated because of that way of perceiving things so uh, where are you going with this i don't know where i'm going with it. i just lost my complete <laughs> no i think you were going to go to um the, the markers the structures the structures that's exactly where i was going to yes, go so yes. let's have a look there just go up here yeah and that one there which i think might have been your team or someone close this is from brisbane Tell us about the structures. We'd love to hear about this from you, Sarah. That one in particular, I don't recall where okay. that's from off the top of my head, but I can tell you about them in general. So mm, yes. there's a variety of structures that we that we find out there that don't seem to be naturally occurring. So there are structures like the one you can see on your screen there that are sort of maybe like a teepee shelter-like mm -hmm. structure. I mean, something like that could potentially be used to put a little baby juvenile in mm -hmm. uh, for shade. Um, something like that looks more like don't go through here. Uh, <laughs> but, so some of the markers are X markers. Some of them are enormous, like the one you've, you've got That's on the, the screen. X. There. There's an X yeah, marker there's there. An X marker. So, yeah. so there's, a, there's, a, there's X markers. There's um, trees that are bowed. Yeah, so you can see the, you can see this. This the bowing on the, the left the hand. Bow. You, yeah. they, they don't see the yeah. cursor on the screen. Yeah. Well. Oh, they can't see the cursor. No, no, oh, can't. What a pity. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's there's large structures like that. Uh, there's also very small 
stick structures. Yeah, see, that's a, mm. another fairly yeah. the thing with the thing with TP like structures. Human beings make those as well, so you have to of be. Mm. You, you have to keep in mind that depending on the location, if there is, if you're anywhere where kids might have been or, mm -hmm. or human beings might have been, um, you can't discount that that it was made by human beings. Uh, but when you see a, 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 a thick diameter tree yeah. that's been snapped off at about the seven foot mark, yeah. um, and then tied down and interwoven with another tree that's also been snapped off. That yeah. it's physically impossible for a human being to mm -hmm. break, and and the thing, one of the giveaways that you that you can you can that, that lends the credibility to the fact that it might have been a yowie was if the branch is not only broken but twisted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only someone yeah. something with hands can twist. Yes, yes. So, so that's what people need to look out for when they, when mm -hmm. they're outdoors if there's been a twist in that break. Because um, the wind doesn't do that. No. Snowfall no. doesn't yeah. do that. No, no. So, um, look, the 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 AYR team find we we call them glyphs to it mm -hmm. sometimes when we see sure. smaller stick uh, figures and patterns on the ground. What they mean, who knows? We don't we don't know. We don't have any answers. We 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 don't have uh, a yaoi telling us what what all of these mean mm. what we do know is that they are communication and it's communication amongst themselves uh, relating to water where's the nearest water source where's the nearest human so go the other way uh, mm -hmm. where there are houses that way there are human being settlements that way go this way there's a food source there there might be a rabbit warren there or a fox den um, you know so it's actually quite common to find those structures out mm -hmm. there um, yeah. communication tools. I, I do. I did interview a witness a few months ago who was up in Queensland and it's up near Gympie, if I remember correctly. He's in a mm -hmm. national park. He saw a yowie that he, he suspected, we suspected listening to the story that it was a juvenile yowie. There was a, a teepee-like structure, a, quite a small one, um, and draped over that was a black and white cow hide. Ooh, for shelter. Wow. The first time I've actually heard that detail before, but it makes sense that mum or dad Yowie is, they might be off hunting. They've left Junior mm. next to the tree to, to, to be safe and to not make so much noise to spook the kangaroos that they're trying to hunt or the deer or whatever. Um, but they've also created a shade. It was quite a hot day. It was the middle of summer mm. uh, and they've, and they've created a shade Further back down the road, this guy had passed a field with black and white cows in it. Um, so, right. yeah, and, and it's out in the middle of the forest. There's no one around. It would be very unusual for a cow hide, a human being, to have mm. gotten one of those cows, killed it, got the hide, made a teepee structure in the middle of the bush. Uh, you know, it, it was un unlikely to be human. Had it been commercially tanned? He well, close enough because yeah, he that's, suddenly... Yeah. This being, there was a there was a, a yowie there sitting mm -hmm. on a log, right. and looking around the forest. Mm -hmm. and, and we, mm -hmm. he was too frightened. He actually yeah, backed sure. away and Got went back to his car. But he's probably he he was smart though because if Junior's there, Mum and Dad are not going to be that far away. Not far, but yeah. Certainly not going to be alone. Um, yeah. So and it was this, very smart there, to get out of there. Mm, mm. And there are numerous cases of them even wearing skins and being sighted wearing that skin or having that skin draped over them. So this is not that unusual mm. in terms of reports. That whole notion of like them just seeping into the environment. Here's an interesting shot you're probably aware of from 1935. How how do you feel about this particular photo? And, again, it's one of those photos where the people that were taking the shot remained unaware, but at the left-hand so side it. there is, are we looking at what possibly is a hairy man? Potentially. And what I love about that photo is is that that if that is indeed a hairy man in the background, it's he is one. enormous. Huge. and And he's, but he's blending in. He's quite mm. camouflaged, isn't he? He's, he's cloaking yeah. to a certain extent. Uh, and that is something that is reported to us regularly yes. is that they have an ability to disappear at will. And mm -hmm. what I have been um, uh, talking to, I guess there, 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 there are, 
There are two camps within Yowie Bigfoot research. Some people believe that these are flesh and blood creatures only. They're another animal. They're a, they're a missing link, ape-like creature. They don't have superhuman abilities or supernatural abilities. There's nothing paranormal about them. They're, they're a flesh and blood only creature. Mm-hmm. Now, there's another, there's a, there, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think there, there is a, they can connect with the spirit realm mm-hmm. uh, and slip between dimensions. They can raise their electromagnetic vibration to a point, their frequency to a point where their body mass becomes light and they, they are not visible anymore. Um, so it's that uh, what is it called the predator? Yes, uh, camouflage yeah. thing. Yes, yeah. Yes. And so I, I've had yeah. quite a few. Re- we've had quite mm. a few reports of people seeing the is outline it- of, mm. of a yowie, a big yeah. bipedal creature standing on two legs, but pixelated, a bit blurry, and but with the same colours of the the trees in the background. Uh, Sorry so, about that. Yeah. No, you're right. Is, uh, you know, uh, is it Bruce Maccabee? No, yes. yeah, and, Bruce and, Maccabee. And I think the the second film by David Pilates yes. they actually have the original optical physicist that's done a lot of work in the US on UFO sightings. Yeah. And his wife, his wife is a hunter. Something, yeah. And you need to look at this documentary if, if you haven't seen it. I haven't it's seen missing it. Missing 411 The Hunted. <laughs> I think okay, you can yeah. actually look at it for free on Tubi. Mm. It's an incredible film, beautifully uh, uh, executed and crowdfunded. But the very end, they have this extraordinary footage that was taken in her phone. On her phone, yes. And they go into the phone. This is one thing where digital analysis is quite astounding, and they see that it's actually operating the phone in a medium, a method that they've never experienced before, and that that footage is showing something that's moving through the trees. Yeah. But you can actually see through it, but you can see a shape. Yeah. Again, it looks like looks like predator. Yeah, it does look like predator. Yeah. Now, a lot more footage of mm. that is coming to light, yeah. and I think that's a brilliant way to perceive this. I think we should remain open to all possibilities. We are far from the jury being in on what this is, yes. and if we limit the scope, we will limit the the ability for our research to kick up results, and we need to also. You know, I found in the ufological world, you know, lots of people want to discount stories of contact, the contactees as opposed to the abductees. They just sound so ludicrous. But the more you investigate and look into them, you find that sometimes these people are telling the truth. And there's extraordinary information that they can't be aware of unless they'd experience something beyond their scope of intellect or understanding. So I think that that's a very honourable way to actually investigate and look into this. And I think it also helps us look at the broader picture, which is massive mm-hmm. in terms of what people experience. Absolutely. Uh, there's there's one thing that's always befuddled me uh, with this thing. It's they're huge. Well, they can be so big, gigantic. They're so strong. They can snap, you know, thick uh, tree trunks and twist them and and do all kinds of things with them. Yet I I, I listen to Sasquatch Chronicles oh, yes. and the yes. st- oh, I love those stories. They're, I they're love just- it. Where's Germa? He's he's my podcast goals. He, he was yeah the- yeah who, absolutely. Listen to 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 him for years. Love it. Yes. So, yeah. um, the one thing that that always gets me is that these that they. The, the Yowies, the Sasquatch, the Bigfoots, they are so strong that they can, you know, they can uproot trees, huge trees, yet they they won't cross or go into a cabin or a house. They won't open the door and go in there and just totally trash the whole place. That Not all the time. There no, are no, no, stories, no. but nine times out of ten well, there are points where they stop. Yeah, they'll throw they'll throw rocks and 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 trunks and branches and all kinds of things at, at cabins or houses or they'll go right up to the window and look into the and but they never just open the door and go into someone's house or or you know a uh, a farm or anything out in the wilderness that that always it's is it like they 
they know not to or that they're not allowed or what's the story there? That just doesn't, because it doesn't make any sense to me at all. No, I, they certainly, there are reports of them coming inside, um, mm. but, but very rare. And But when people are in there? I've, I can actually remember one and it's quite really? a famous Australian okay. one. It's a, okay. a, a guy, a, a man, and I can't remember who it was or where it was now. There's so, <laughs> there's so many cases floating yeah, around. Yeah, sure, people. I understand that. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember which one, but it's, it's quite a well, well-known one. Uh, you'll find it in... Um, Tony Healy and Paul Cropper's. Book. All right, yeah, yeah. So, which, yeah. which is a really important book, and we should also oh, talk yes. talk about their groundbreakers like yourself and Absolutely. Dean and the, and the research group. Um, yep. They've been out there for a long time, and of course, they take in a myriad of possibilities as well. There, are, one of them's done extensive research into poltergeist incidents in this country and overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, keep going down; it'll appear. Um, Out of the Shadows is the name yeah. of that book. Sorry, right. well, we might we yeah. might have popped it up. We might have Dude. lost it in the midst of things. It's outrageous. It is I've had outrageous. I've on the show a couple of times, actually. He's he's a lovely man. They're both really, really yeah. lovely people. They're mm-hmm. working on their third book. It's It was supposed to be published by the end of this year, but they've had a bit of a delay, so they're looking at maybe February, March next year. Okay. Well, that'll be exciting because they are, like Dean and yourself, they are meticulous as well and very scientifically based and just incredible information that they've brought brought up. So maybe what we'll do is let's pop to impossible visits here. Mm -hmm. One overseas researcher I'm very touched by is Christopher Noel. He's a bit like a Taoist monk that has come to this and he's lived in a cohabitation raising his, That's his, daughter, his young it? daughter yeah. for many years it's great to see her in her teenage years now she sort of dad goes what do you think of this structure and she goes well it's like the hundreds i've seen before dad i've got other <laughs> more important things in my life to deal deal with and she just dismisses it out of hand she knows there's a reality yeah. to it but what christopher noel has pointed out is that there is a relationship to power lines and electricity, like cases you were speaking about before. Mm. He speaks about, and this is an incredible book, about the uh, hypothesis he came up with, which is the um, autistic savant. savant. So at times they show sort of stimming, which is where people will see them hiding behind a tree, flashing back and out, you know, going backwards and forwards. And I'm just curious on what you think of his research and these really peculiarities that he has picked up on in his years of cohabitation. It's not just the wood knocks or the tree breaks. It's these other subtler things. I think that's the astounding thing about them too is that they can be so subtle in the environment. They can move things, a tiny little small object or gift you with a small object which you couldn't imagine with something with that much power and weight has that subtlety. But if it has consciousness on the level that we do, then that would make complete sense, wouldn't it, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've, I've had the, the, the good fortune I, uh, lately of uh, looking into a bit of that side of there's, – there's a few uh, American guys mm. out there who, who have – uh, a very strong spiritual connection with Sasquatch and have regular interactions, regular regular little gifts that are left, mm-hmm. uh, like mm-hmm. special-looking rocks or a feather or uh, a glyph, like twigs that have been bent into uh, particular shapes. Um, uh, so, so there's this, there's this, th- there is this other level of, if you if you get away from they're just flesh and blood, mm-hmm. and we start thinking about these beings as as a, a people, as a highly intelligent, mm. uh, highly intelligent hominin being like us, different. They're different, mm. but they're just different, as intelligent, yeah. if not more intelligent. Um, they have this ability to communicate telepathically or, or mind speak. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm now starting to to talk to quite a few people who have these experiences themselves here in Australia Mm. and in the United States. So there is absolutely connection. They are communicating Mm -hmm. with people who are open to communicate with them. 
uh, and they're and communicating on many different levels. One of the most interesting for us is Snow White Bigfoot out of the US because she has like a caring background. I think she's a nurse and her husband and her live on a property that has had this activity continuously. And she does virtually a weekly or bi-weekly Bigfoot diary. And she leaves things out on her porch and these uh, objects come and go. Are you aware of her research? And it's really humbling her research. But because she's amazing. She is such a beautiful soul. And her husband gets very frustrated because they go into the garage and they remove tools, tools and bring them back. <laughs> but, but her interaction <laughs> is astounding. And she documents every single thing that she does. So she documents what she's put out and then she documents what's come back or what they've left for her or she will leave things and they will go away from, you know, they'll disappear for months and months and then they'll reappear again. So and I think she's gone to somebody else's property. Very and close by. Very close by. And some of her husband's tools have appeared there. So, you know, he's a bit. And mm. you know what? It's taken a toll on her. She's yeah. had times where she's had to not go up online because it's just too much to deal with everything, the loved ones in your life, mm. your property. Yeah. And then this stuff is constantly there. And also, I think no matter how hard we intellectually try to pull back from it, that fear is there too of the unknown, the unpredictable. Mm. So mm. it does wear you down. And she's had moments where she's had to stop and then she comes back to it refreshed. Yeah, and, so that's Snow White Bigfoot. She's and, on YouTube. And what I'm going to look her up. I've never heard of yeah, her. Yeah, look her up. She's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, what profoundly it. affects me is the toll that it takes on people's lives. All we need is one or two qualified scientists to step on board and, and, you know, assist these people that are doing the work of tens of people mm. that are qualified, getting an income and surviving okay and being safe and able to go home at the end of night. Some of these people can't. Their home is basically their scientific research lab. Yeah. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, the two guys I was thinking of, just so you guys know, you can look them mm -hmm. up. They do a podcast together. Uh, the podcast has a very weird name. It's called Pork and Beans. Right. <laughs> really weird. Pork so and American. Beans. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you'll find them on YouTube. Um, okay. They've got, a, they've got a Facebook site as well. But it's Mike, Mike, Michael Harrell and Brian Bland. Uh, we don't do know them. Great information. Thank Both you. Both lovely people. I was a guest on their show uh, mm -hmm. a little while back, and um, I, I really enjoy listening to their their communications with Susqu with the Sasquatch over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brian's actually just put out a book on, on the subject as well. So if you want to look him up, Brian Bland, um, uh, he's, I can't remember the name of the book, but it'll be something about Sasquatch and, yeah. you know, communication with them. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's got, another really interesting point. Then you triggered me. The uh, documentary by David Pilates, the second one, The Hunted, and he's just, I think, in the last few days come out with the next documentary, mm. which we haven't seen yet, mm. which the is UFO called Missing Connection. The UFO Connection. Yeah. In that documentary, they have actually the uh, original people that were highly qualified, actually, but they are all uh, hunters themselves that have recorded what seems to be an incredibly complex form of language. Oh, language, yeah. And this is the Sierra sounds mm. you oh, should yes. be aware of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, it was analysed. After they recorded that um, many years later, it was analysed by an ex-Navy uh, trans language transcriptions mm -hmm. expert. Uh, so this is a man who transcribes enemy language yeah. uh, and might not necessarily know the actual, speak the language, but he can phonetically write down what, what the sounds are. Mm -hmm. um, and so he and he spent many, many hours analysing the 60-odd hours of Sierra Sounds that that that, um, that uh, Ron Moorhead got. That's right, Ron, uh, Ron Moorhead. Ron Moorhead and there's another guy and I can't remember his name now. Um, there were two of them. But um, Jeff N Nelson. Nelson is the surname of the, the Navy guy. And he his conclusion was that this is a language. Right. It's not yeah. just it's not just it's not gibberish. You know, it's not gibberish and it's yeah. not just communication sounds like dogs make together mm -hmm. or it's it's language with mm -hmm. syntax mm -hmm. uh, with with 
components that are language. So if, if you're not convinced that there are people um, by yeah. that yeah. alone, uh, I don't know. Well, they've got voice boxes, you know, they can speak. And, and I mean, the other thing is we now, all that technology is there in our computer. We're in an extraordinary moment in time. It's like a camera is in the hand of every individual. We have never had this ability to be able to record and analyze to the extent we can do it now. We can do it professionally at home. And as soon as you run those sounds through some form of analysis, there are massive worldwide databases and they're completely unique. And at the moment, we're hearing my cat, who's not that unique <laughs> and getting a bit old, but I'll start patting him and it'll calm down. All right, that's Anton. So excuse that. Very timely, Anton, with yeah. the Sierra Sounds yeah, discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. Do you... Uh... Where, are we gonna, where do we want to go? Okay. What do you think of these photos, which absolutely blew us away? Because a lot of this, you sort of sometimes have to go off your intuition mm. to go, are we dealing with reality or not? Now, you might have seen a, a bit more analysis than we have, but Todd Standing's photographs, um, let's have a look, little look, Asper, Sam, which were like really such, do you know Todd Standing's work? You must be aware of that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, and I'm aware of that picture. He's a very controversial figure, and mm. to be honest, I haven't, I haven't researched him heavily myself yet, so I can't, mm -hmm. I can't tell you if there are some people that believe that these photos mm. are fakes, that they're, they're, they're hoaxes somehow, and that he's used his, his own face as a template and mm. somehow used Photoshop, CGI, magic. <laughs> <Puss -puss>. Yeah, <laughs> CGI <laughs> magic to create mm -hmm. these images. So that's there is one school of thought that doesn't believe mm -hmm. him, but there are also many people who who who, who think he's legit. Um, if they are legit, how remarkable! How wonderful. I know, I know. How beautiful! Look at those beautiful faces. So, so would that would that school of um you know that thought that he's he's that. um yeah. would they be the skeptics? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, look. You know what? I think the biggest okay. problem here, for, well, and the yeah. thing that made me feel like there, there's something genuine here, mm. and it's it's the only way with something like this that is so hyper aware of us and the danger with that we bring to their environment, or is slipping in and out of some form of quantum entanglement. You have to have an incredibly obsessive individual to go out and do this. That is going to go out there and spend hundreds of hours in the wilderness. And two pieces of news footage convinced me that he could be genuine. And that were times where he actually went missing for days and there were massive tens of thousands of dollars search parties out for him right. that made me yeah. think there's something genuine to this. You know, anyone can go online and talk a story up, but, you know... Here is some news evidence to back up that research. He'd been cornered by some bear or something somewhere and he couldn't get away from it. He'd, and I've uh, seen those yeah. stories and they spoke nothing about his Bigfoot research no. at all. They just spoke about him being a very frustrating individual because <laughs> he is wasting the government's money being out in the wilderness alone and should have had better backup there. Yeah. So who yeah. knows? But well, look, there is. Just... Uh, I have shown them to effects specialists that we know. Mm hmm that had a real dilemma trying to debunk them. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that's that's part of that's why he's been difficult to yeah. to say whether it's legit or not. Is is they are difficult to debunk. The thing is, with with any sort of photographic evidence, if you weren't there, no. th there's there's a very there are a very vocal uh, group of Bigfoot, Yowie, hairy band researchers out there who who like to drag down everything um, mm. and they won't ever believe anything. So they always complain that the, oh, everyone's got blurry photos and why can't anybody take a good, everyone's oh, got, there you go. why yeah. can't anybody take a good photo anymore? Having my team got some of the most remarkable footage that exists. There are people out there doing whole videos trying mm. to debunk my team. And you I can't know, win. You can't win. I know. Yeah, so that when they're footage. blurry, it's like, why are they blurry? And when they're clear as day, they're as fake. that is, yeah. they're like, oh, no, that's that's a hoax. 
It's exactly. like what, so you can't what win. do people want? No, you, you can't. can't win. Yeah. Uh, and you're never going to convince some people of anything. And well, but you that's don't. Okay. You, that's all yeah, right. you, you don't, don't need to. You know what I say to people? If, you know, if they'll come to us and start conversing on, um, you know, whatever we're, we're researching at the time, and I usually say to them, have you read any of the research? Have you read any books? Have you done any research into the subject? And they usually say no because they'll say, oh, that isn't that just, you know, fancy, you know, fancy field stuff that you're looking into? And I'm like, have you done any of the research? Have you read any of the information? And I'll say no. And I'm like, well, I'm not even going to discuss this with you because you're talking out of your whatever. Mm -hmm. You have no clue about you know, what you're talking about. So when you do some research, then we'll discuss. But now I'm just, you know, which you're just talking to me from your narrow-minded viewpoint of something you know nothing about. Yeah. And and anyone who says, who complains that there aren't, that everyone's photos yeah, are blurry, yeah. hasn't been in the situation where you're suddenly looking at what you think is a monster Mm. Your body, your, yeah. the physiological uh, things that happen in your body when you're in a moment like that is generally flight, not fight. Yes. Or you no, you might course. breathe, but it's yeah. flight and you are terrified and you could be peeing your pants in terror <laughs> as you run literally. away. Oh, it's been reported. Literally. Yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, literally yeah. pissing your pants as you run for your life. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not really a Kodak moment where you're going to go, <laughs> no, cheese. No, no. It? it is no just, Kodak no. moment. No, you're, and, you're and, turning around. You're, you're about to spin around and run for your life. You're not yeah. sort of focusing and, hey, No, you're yeah, not thinking you're about taking a photo. No. But, no. We're, we, you know, we're in the 21st century, Sarah. We, we have this woke world. We should respect the way that people perceive. All our perception is different. It's based on nature and nurture. That's our neural pathways have been created that way. Everyone thinks slightly differently. We should have respect for each other's opinion and perception, mm. no matter how different it is to ours. And to have this destructive, he who doth protest, and Shakespeare said they're hiding something <laughs> when they do that, when they protest too hard, yeah. they are yes. really hiding something. And nine times out of ten, I believe that when you are faced with this criticism – and constructive criticism has to be the biggest oxymoron in the English language. When you're faced with this criticism, it really is a reflecting pull. Uh, the person that's being targeted is not really where the criticism aimed. Mm. It's aimed by the person targeting them. Yeah. They need to look at themselves. I see that with gender. I see that in so many other ways that we perceive the world. And, you know, I think it's a problem when you come together as a group of people to find some sense of unity and to be open to each other's difference. And that's one thing your research group has stood proud in being accepting of other people's perception and being open to that difference and containing itself together as a unified force. And that unified force is up against so much, it's incredibly frustrating. One of the real pioneers of this research on television, because I still believe the medium of television and film are where major breakthroughs could occur, because it's so creatively bankrupt, it is so de desperate for material, that just in the wake of it, by throwing money at these shows, something's got to mm. kick up eventually. Yeah. And one of the pioneers of that was Autumn here who I keep hitting the wrong thing there, don't I? I'm just hopeless today with this computer. Yeah, no, you're right. And it's just being around Sarah. It's being so, like, startled mm. by someone so <laughs> profound. <sorry>. Autumn Williams. <laughs> and I think she did a show initially for Animal Planet, wasn't mm. it, very early mm. in the piece, yes. which had her out in the field. I don't know if you're aware of this book, Enoch. It's another incredible tale of cohabitation and a very worthwhile book. And I just wanted to mention her name as another strong female character that's carried in the, the field. Yeah. Because the there's field. not many female females in this. One of our field. pioneers, who I don't believe is very well at the moment, and at moments has had research that's highly debatable, but did break the ground, has to be Rex Gilroy. 
Yes. And we have to do, we have to acknowledge the extraordinary work of, of Rex against all odds. I think Rex at many times just went a little too far with some of that research. <laughs> but, yes. you know, it was, imagine how difficult it was in his time yeah. to articulate these stories. Now, maybe you can now tell us a little bit about approaching the Indigenous community in a respectful way to find out more information on this parallel hominid. Well, generally you don't approach them about this subject because you mm. you probably won't get much information from right. them. Mm -hmm. I've been incredibly fortunate to have spoken to uh, quite a few original Australians about the hairy man and I've I've had uh, just recently in the last few months I had uh, two original Australian elders, Uncle Donnie and Auntie Luna, uh, approach me because they had been following my work uh, with AYR and with my my own podcast with Yowie Central and they were impressed with our work and our research and the respect that we have for for these beings and they wanted to share some of their their stories, their personal mm -hmm. stories with me, which Incredible. was an absolute honour. Uh, it was so delightful. We're finding more and more that more and more Aboriginal Australians are, are happy to share this when we approach, when, when we are clearly approaching with respect mm. and honouring mm. their cultural law and their knowledge on, on this. Of course, um, it is deemed sacred, isn't it? This is sacred knowledge. It's sacred knowledge. It's knowledge of the dreaming, that, that which is that invisible world. It's dreaming mm. knowledge. And if you're not... If a, if a person isn't worthy of, and by that I mean respectful, more than worthy, mm -hmm. it's not about yeah. who they are. It's 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 about if 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 someone doesn't really believe in it, if they're a bit disrespectful of mm. uh, the culture, then you, you're not going to you're not going to have anyone sharing their knowledge with you. No, uh, of course not. So. No, so it's about uh, it's about ap approaching them with deep respect. Um, and, and also respecting the fact that some things are for you to know and some things are, for, are not for you to know. Um, and, and you kind of have to earn that respect to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can always, I mean, Auntie Luna said to me just not that long ago, um, yeah, he said you can ask about this stuff but you won't get that many people telling you about it. Um, mm -hmm. You've generally got to wait for them to come to you. But um Showing, showing that you're interested in asking respectful questions, you might not get direct answers straight away, but then a few weeks later that same person, that same original Australian, might decide that they can share mm -hmm. things with you. So it's not getting disheartened by if you get an immediate rebuff, not, yeah. not, getting, not getting disheartened by that. Saying that, though, um, I, I did interview just the other day um, a lovely man called River Morris. Now, River's uh, a Wiradjuri man from New South Wales, but he's based in, in South Australia. He does a radio show. And he's been on quite a few shows, uh, Bigfoot shows in the US, and he's was interviewed by Australian Yowie Research uh, by Paul Cropper back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so he's on one of our videos. You'll find him on, on YouTube. Uh, and he, he believes that we need to share this information, that the original Australian knowledge needs to be shared with everybody and he wants to share it. So there are there are original Australians like that who are happy to share because they think that it, everyone should should know about these beings, one, to warn them yeah, because, because you could be in danger or, or simply so you don't get such a shock if you do see, if you do see one of these beings that mm. they, he, he feels that everyone should know that they exist. Um, so that people aren't quite as shocked. Uh, but then you get Uncle Donnie and Auntie Luna, they're sharing their knowledge because they're, they're afraid that their knowledge will be lost mm. if right. they don't share it. So they've got kind of different motivations for sharing sure. their knowledge. Um, you also find that some original Australians don't want to talk about it because they think by talking about it aloud it will bring them to them especially if they're people who live out in the bush. Right. Um, you, don't, you don't go out at night because old red mm. eye, old red sure. eye will get you. Um, the hairy man or old red eye will get you. So there's a, there's a mix of different attitudes out there amongst original Australians in sharing this, this knowledge. 
Um, but I, but I, I am so delighted every time we get someone because we do, we ha- we do get people coming forward sometimes, and more mm-hmm. and more. Um, I'm, I'm so delighted when I hear stories from Original Australians because they know about these beings. Yeah, they have course. stories going back millennia. Uh, they've lived alongside the, their brothers, their mm-hmm. hairy brothers and sisters for a long time, and they they consider them to be their brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And that's that's. <laughs> And I think they've got a respect for them. Yes. And and it's all about us having that respect as well, being aware of the markers yeah. and being aware that we're we're denigrating their environment entirely. Now Absolutely. we were speaking before about Christopher Noel, and he started to believe that these creatures come closer than what any of us could imagine. Yeah. They weave the tree line to make it virtually impossible for us to see them. But they are going down routes out of national parks into orchards at night. They're coming up to properties late at night. And he's shown even in the state some areas where they're right in built-up environments. How, how does your research perceive that notion? Same. We get re- reports of the weirdest places where you think, how on earth did they get there? That's so It's so close to a major city. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in the outskirts of a major city and you think, wow, that's really strange. But if you if you look on the map, then you realise that there's a national park here and there's a, there's, a, there's a creek system that connects that national park to the next grassy open area or next bushland area. And then mm-hmm. there's, so there's this, this chain, cha- chain of bushland often connected by watercourses uh, that, that they can travel in. Uh, mm-hmm. So, we, yeah, we get reports of them looking in people's windows, coming right up close into the outskirts of major cities. Sydney, for example, we've had them very close, you know, around the, the, the edges of massive city like Sydney, um, and we're getting reports of them coming in very close. Uh, so, you know, that Royal National Park that's just south of, of Sydney, there's so, mm. many, so much activity in there. Oh. Um, we a, have Yowie a- Bay. I mean, we've got... We've yes. got- Landmark areas named after them. I right? think it's called Yao Bay for a reason. <laughs> yeah, and, and Katoomba yeah. has always been an yeah. extraordinary hot spot. Now, oh, absolutely. Yeah. we're not just looking at these huge hominids. And here's another interesting thing that fascinates me: is the size that some of these can be. And when you're finding prints there that are 15, 16, 17 inches in length, yeah. Yeah. what size are we looking at there? There's some reports I've actually seen where which go up over 10 foot tall. Yeah, 10, 11, 12, 15 is probably wow. the highest that oh. I've heard. Yeah, right. That would be such That's a shock. That's pretty huge. That would be yeah. such a shock. Yeah. It's oh. hard enough going up to a horse that can yeah. stand yeah. over <laughs> you and, and the fear inside of you knowing yes. that this animal has the power to actually harm you and then stay yeah. very still. So, Well, the two, the two beings that Buck Buckingham captured on the thermal camera, um, measuring the trees and the, the palms that they were hiding behind, because we know mm. the exact spot, um, they were at least 10 foot tall. Mm. At least and, and probably. That's slightly. pretty imposing. Yeah. How do you feel when you're out in the field? Have you actually, have you had a, a sighting ever or an experience out there? It's experiences, yes, but not a sighting yet. Right, okay. I, yeah. um, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I would love to, but I, I would love it to be sort of a, a non-scary one. So. Do you, well, what's a non-scary one? I mean, well, I don't want know. to be chased or stalked <laughs> no, or, okay. yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. roared yeah. at. Like some people have, <laughs> some people are stalked through the bush sure. and they have something Bluff charging them, yeah, crashing yeah. through the bush, mm-hmm. running at them, screaming, roaring at them. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. is, you know, Frightening. You, need, you need clean underwear after that sort sure. of we, we We so, went recently, well, in the last couple no, of years, no, down to Wombian Cave with the kids. And I actually was what? scared, petrified, when a baby Joey bluff charged me. <laughs> You know, the noise, the noise. No, no, it's sincerely, it was quite frightening. I I think it was a wallaby, (laughs) even smaller than a kangaroo. But the noise it was making and the commotion was so alien to me. And I had my youngest grandson with me, but it was a bluff charge. 
And we were holding on to those kids for dear life. <laughs> and, uh, and, and sounds sounds are magnified, particularly at night yeah. and if you can't see. Sure. Um, that everything sounds much louder than mm-hmm. and sounds bigger than what it And your imagination, especially if you've got this in the back of your mind that it's always yeah. a possibility. It just goes wild. But there's also statistically a huge amount of evidence that there is an amazing, uh, an astounding attraction to the female of the species. Yeah. And that there is a lot more, I've read a lot more reported cases mm. of like telepathic, some of oh, them, yeah. and, you know, should I go there? I don't know. But verge on that level of like eroticism and sensuality that, yes. that sound like they're absolutely genuine and, how frightening, how confronting that could be. There are stories of um, of Yowies and, in fact, all over the world of the hairy mm-hmm. man mm-hmm. kidnapping f- Women. human females and, yeah. and uh, having sex with them. There definitely are stories like that all over the place. Yeah. Um, I, all... I've often been told by original Australians, don't go out walking in the bush when you're menstruating. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And that yeah. would be, I mean, it's it's odd, you know, when we look at all this phenomena, I mean, that was one thing that John Keel was documenting in the Mothman prophecies. They would, you know, they would see this being following the, the blood truck, uh, women menstruating. I've had it in UFO experiences that, you know, women menstruating and all of a sudden this object over the top of the car. And right. when we look at Melbourne, Thank Captions. God I've got menopause now. DNA. Well, you, you think having a period would be enough, but oh, I'm, yeah, I know. But then I'm you've got like a trail of all these weirdos, who are UFOs, you know, yes. sharks in the water. It's like everyone's behind you. But look, I got my old menopause. Remember when I was up in consumer doing a speech and I had this body flushing, and I thought I've picked this up through osmosis. For Thirty-two years we've been married, so I could pick it up through osmosis. Yeah, God, we do diverted there yeah, we have but i think when we look at the bigfoot dna stuff and when they've actually done incredible analysis we are seeing female dna in there but not male dna well not male as we the male so there's been dna that's come back that the the the, the mother was a uh, a human yep, yep. and the the, the the father is <laughs> they don't know they don't know what the dna is the male exactly. part of that yeah, which is yeah. so. Have you been able to utilize like these new scientific trends in things like environmental DNA? Has that worked for your research? Team? And what about the nuclear DNA now? They're doing nuclear DNA Nucleoid, testing. Yeah. yeah, I do know that we had um, the boys found some scat uh, oh, last scat. year mm. and they sent it away to we have um, a, a contact who's a scientist. And how um, big would a scat from a 10 foot? <laughs> you interrupted Sorry. really brilliant. No, seriously. No, Sarah, we'll get back to that. But how big would that scat be? And how did they know that it was scat from a a big, uh, you know, a yowie and not, I don't know. I mean, what's the biggest thing we've got out there? A a kangaroo? Now, let Sarah talk here. Calm down. (laughs) No, no. So generally, I mean, if you think about um, they're going to be big, they're going to be bigger than, well, depending on the size of the yowie, of course. Sure. The scat that the boys found it, it was on a rock in the middle of a creek. Mm-hmm. It was a very strange place for any other creature to have stopped yeah, right. and, right. and defecated. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the analysis that was done failed to find, uh, it, now I'm, I better get this story right, mm-hmm. failed to find um, parasite eggs in that scat um, that would indicate that it was any other animal that is known. Right. So, it, it, so we had, we had, it was a large sample. It's, mm-hmm. It had a very noxious smell. Um, Gary, right. Gary Lynn and, and Buck Buckingham <gasps> had a bit of a whiff. There's actually, we've got a video of them. <laughs> those two have been through <laughs> hell for this research. <laughs> burnt they have their been eyes. Hell. Yeah. yeah, they have. It burnt their nose and their eyes and, and wow. uh, it was really, really full-on smell. Mm-hmm. And, and that scat came back as it said that there wasn't enough DNA Oh, I hate uh, that. But, but there was. Because when he ate a truckload, they, they just couldn't the identify. Who? Surely yeah. there's enough DNA in yeah, there. If they can do environmental DNA, yeah. which can track an animal that was six yeah. months ago walked very rapidly yeah, through, through a riverbed. And they've got a pile of poo and they can't yeah. find. I mean, what a load. It's the scientists there. Yeah. 
having a you know they're having a consensus reality collapse. Yeah, they have, and yeah. they just won't go any. It's not a but listen, people. This is not a question of belief. Yeah, it's a question of science. Mm. Yeah, and but and wouldn't you go this? Have, sorry, yeah, go, go on. on. No, no, no you go. Say, unfortunately, we don't have at this stage voicing an interest in Sasquatch or Yowies mm. is career suicide. Yeah, forget yeah. forget your tenure, forget your mm -hmm. funding Everything. for any future research, yeah. forget yeah. your career. So, mm -hmm. the scientist that that did that analysis for us and and does the analyze, analyzes hair samples and things like that for us, he does it in secret. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's not. He's, it's it's not on the books um, mm -hmm. because there is no one who will who will take it seriously who's prepared mm -hmm. to put themselves out there. Uh, and risk everything. There's a few more scientists in the United States mm -hmm. who, are, who are vocal about it, but um, it's re it's actually really hard to find any scientist who will take it seriously. But is that why is there nobody mm -hmm. willing to step forward and say, "Look, this is what I found"? I mean, that could make your career. You've just, yeah. you know, you've identified a, a homonym that's hey, listen, living in parallel church, i mean catholic you know. church pardon copernicus what about five years ago yeah, that but was the old catholic long church time. has been molesting <laughs> little children as well okay. so okay. i'm not going to take them seriously seriously come on yeah come on yeah. Yeah. yeah and this is really frustrating and and very disheartening because i feel in a way and i don't know how your research team feels i feel like the majority of evidence to support that we have a legitimate real phenomenon occurring here that needs a lot of work and to go out there and look into that field. And it's all about respecting the environment we've got around us. The information's already there in the public domain. Yep, it is. And we have, there are people, there's a, an American scientist. He's a primatologist. He's mm -hmm. an expert in bi the evolution of bipedal locomotion. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's uh, uh, an anatomist so he's he's very very clever and, and his skills and knowledge particularly in this area he believes 100 percent that there is a huge bipedal being out there that's leaving footprints yes um and i've read he's got a fantastic book on sasquatch that i that i've read and and he goes through how he started you know not really being sure and thinking it was a bit strange but is now 100 percent convinced that something is leaving trace evidence, i.e. Yeah. tracks. Yes. And they're leaving five-toed tracks, they're leaving three-toed, four-toed, six-toed tracks. But something wow. is leaving tracks, enormous mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah. And so, in those tracks there's the dermal ridges that are yes. on there, you know, all that yep. all that information that if it was somebody with a piece of wood, you there's know, cut mid, out in mid the tassel and break. Just, yeah, the mid, yeah. Mid tassel so break, yeah. it's you're like not the evidence is there, but nobody's willing to to come out and say yes, it does exist. Well, people have not been yet. willing, and they've copped it. Yeah, I know. know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Melba Ketchum, for example, who did a DNA study on on how on courageous Sasquatch. is that individual? So courageous, and she got hammered, absolutely mm, yeah. hammered by the scientific community. Um, so when you do DNA studies like that, from what I understand it, and I'm no scientist, I'm not an expert at this mm -hmm. at all, but from what I understand. You have to have a, a, an actual DNA sample to match it with. So every time that we send in hair samples or fecal mm. samples, mm. they come back DNA unknown. And it's unknown because we don't have an original sample to match it with. So, well, I mean, that is what the about, easiest way to dispute Well, what about this? if they collate all the samples that have been sent in that are unknown and look at all of them, they'd get something from that evidence, wouldn't they? You'd think? You'd think so. You'd, You'd think, think so. But then they start to say, oh, no, it's contaminated. Or, oh, what does um, that mean? This well, is what but, happened but, to me. That means yeah. we don't know what it is. Well, but some, sometimes because there's human mitochondrial DNA in yeah. there, they, they then think, oh, well, some some human being is somehow in collecting that evidence from the field and transporting it to the lab that someone, uh -huh. some human beings... Uh, DNA has somehow got into that sample is yeah, what they're okay. saying. Um, so we're telling you. It's a bit Jeffrey you, Epstein, isn't oh it? Of all the time for the cameras <laughs> to fail, for them to leave too many sheets in there, oh you know, it all happened but here it's and there. Like, but yeah. like I said, it's like if they collected, if they got all the, uh, you know, the samples that have been contaminated, 
and looked at all those, then they would be able to get some sort of, you know, analysis from there, wouldn't they? You'd think so. you think what so. What kind of scientists are they? <laughs> the people no, who are seriously, interested in I'm asking their, what kind of they're scientists. They're scientists saving their jobs. Oh, well, scientists. that's not real science, is it? You must have seen no. this in welfare and the work you did. You know, I would go to someone who uh, was suffering intense schizophrenia and the way that they were self-medicating was with alcohol. And I was told by the crisis team, we cannot deal with this person until they've detoxed. Off the alcohol. Off the alcohol. And I'm going, they're never going to detox. They're never going to detox. No, no, they're not because they're in trauma. Yep. <laughs> they're self-medicating because yep. of their mental health issues. And you know what? Here, bang, you know, we slip right next to this. How many people out there have experienced this phenomena or a myriad of other ones that have to self-medicate? to be able to integrate back into society to yeah. some extent, you know, constructively or deconstructively because of what this does, how yeah, it yeah. alienates you, how yeah. it traumatises you. And and I that's why I think it's so courageous what your team is doing. Thanks. I have spoken mm. to several people who, who um, and one person who has self-medicated his whole life as a result mm. of UFO yeah. and Yowie yeah. experiences. Um, in fact, he's yeah to the point of alcoholism and and uh, you know not significantly affecting his health, his physical mm -hmm. and mental health. Uh, other people who've needed antidepressants, um, who've needed um, diazepam, Valium, you know, who've, who've needed anti-anxiety medication. Lots, lots, and lots of people out wow. there. Who and the heartbreaking thing is, those drugs create their own inroads and well, start to issues. create. Yeah. And you know what? These are not lifestyle choices, you know. <laughs> this is because yeah. people are traumatised yeah. and need assistance with that trauma and need to, to actually find other people to express these stories to and get them out. And that's why I think what you're doing is probably the, some of the most valuable, if not the most valuable work in the field. And it really is the gold standard of this sort of work. It can assist all of us, even people completely naive to that subject matter. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think let's talk about your podcast. You do a very broad podcast. How can people find out about that? Where can they watch it, listen to it, and what's the name of it? So it's called Yowie Central, and you can find it on all the major platforms, so Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stitcher, Amazon, all, all of the major podcast platforms. Um, and you can uh, – it covers – I started off, as I said, introducing my local community to the concept of Bigfoot. Uh, and and what I quickly realised is that a lot of the people who experience – who have Yowie experiences often have ghost experiences and yeah, UFO right. experiences and orbs and see other cryptid – dogman mm -hmm. – experiences there's yeah. quite a few reports yeah. of dog man I, i've even spoken to someone who saw a goat man um, what do you think dog man is million dollar question um i've no idea i do think that dog man is responsible for our werewolf legends yeah right, right. what's oh that? i haven't seen that photo what's that's, that that's Just, a recent that's a photo out of the states that's rather odd it's rather that disturbing, is really odd i'm not yeah, sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So I, mean, I, I'm not sure. What, Do, Dog Man is is they're definitely out there as well. Um, right. I have interviewed and and have a good buddy now. John Kershaw has become a good buddy of mine, and he's got three mm -hmm. photos that he took near. He was on the outskirts of Sydney, wow. and he was stalked and chased and and bluff charged by a dog man. He uh, saw it. He, he saw it. Snapped a couple of photos with his wow. phone over his shoulder as he was right. running away. All right. And yep. got three images of, mm -hmm. a, a, and he's been back to the same spot with Attila Cowley and, and, and Yowie Dan who made yeah. that documentary track. Yes. Um, yeah. So they've gone back with him to the to, and found the exact spot and they worked out that this being had to have been nine foot tall at least. Wow. And, and looking at the photo, there's two black pointy ears and right. what appears to be a pointy German snout. shepherdy kind of snout, um, wow. peering at him through the bushes. So, so they're they're definitely out there. There are more and more mm. people reporting seeing those beings. 
I think there's quite a few people who talk about the veil being very thin at the mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. And and so that seems to be corresponding with an uptick in uh, reports of strange cryptid beings, not just Yowies, but all sorts mm. of weird things going on out there. Um, I'm what, not sure what, what they are. What would, you, what would that be from? Have, do you have any assumption or supposition as to why the veil is thin at this time? So one of the explanations I've heard is that the planet is undergoing an, an ascension from 3D to 5D. Oh. And, and that means that the planet, that itself, do it. that the planet do it. itself is going through a, a, a vibrational change. Right. Uh, and that's causing the other beings that live in other dimensions mm. that are all around us all the time, that we just don't perceive them, that that's causing us to be able to see these beings right. before we, we couldn't uh, because at our bodies are resonating and, and vibrating at a higher um, frequency mm-hmm. together with the planet. So that's I'm, – I'm not an expert on that. I, I don't know the truth of that. Um, that's that's one of the things. There's a lot of people talking about that out there in the world at the moment. Right. Okay. Of the planet from 3D to 5D. And, mm-hmm. and I have heard uh, spiritual people – shamans shamanic healers Mm -hmm. uh other really wise spiritually connected people who are who are who are connected with that other realm all talk about this is happening to our planet at the moment so that's one of the ideas i'm not sure have you heard of that idea before Yes, we have. And, well, and, and you know, my son keeps talking about that all the time. Yeah, but anyway. yeah, well, my yeah. stepson's yeah, in yeah, touch with yeah. a lot of uh, American shamans. Uh, American Indians, And, and yeah. you know, my background was in mental health. As I said to you early off the podcast that I had a band together of people that suffered bipolar disorder, depression yeah. and schizophrenia. Yeah. And I began to realise that these people were probably the most insightful, honest people I've ever come across. And... Uh, they were probably the shamans a couple of hundred years ago, and now in our culture, they're relegated, they're put on the tranquilizers, they're tucked in the back rooms, and, mm-hmm. and it's pushed away. Whereas in a tribal culture, those people would have been embraced and looked after and maybe taken a bit of their enlightenment in that moment that we call psychosis, that we don't have the time to deal with you know, endlessly vacuously busy, busy lives. Busy lives. <laughs> but uh, I, I have heard that and I think that um, it really does feel for me in terms of it, it's really hard to disseminate that, isn't it? Is it just the time that technologically we've reached a, vo- a point where these counter voices now are rising to the surface and we're becoming a lot more aware of possibilities than we ever have? Or it does seem logical to me that something is occurring out there. How do you perceive the notion of dealing with the trauma of this phenomena and integrating it back into your own life? And and in a sense, can I even ask you a bigger question? How do you perceive consciousness itself? Right. That's a big question. (laughs) How do I perceive consciousness? I, I, I don't quite know how to answer that question. How do you perceive consciousness? Is it, well, is it I, I talking think, about our, our, are you talking about our spirit? Uh, I think yeah, you can put it in that term. So, I mean, neuroscience now is beginning to realise that there may be a difficulty in perceiving consciousness to just be part of the double cerebellum. Physiologically. So it's like outside. Of- so could it be outside like the morphogenic resonance, like what Jung spoke about, the mind at large? And and I, I have a really strong feeling that with these encounters with the Yowie, with anomalous objects, even the Min Min Light, drovers have spoken about this thing seemed to stop and have some personal interaction with me. I felt it deep within my consciousness, within my soul. So excuse me for being so convoluted there, Sarah, but I think that's the point I was getting at too. It's a bit like Wes at the end of the Satch Cross Chronicles goes, how do you, what do you see this, this, this big foot to be? Mm. But I think it's consciousness. Mm. I think it has to do with the way we think. 
I, I think that, I think that, that, are you saying that those beings are there but they don't actually really exist, that they're just a figment of our... Con- oh, our no, 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 they're not. I think what I'm saying is do we have a personal relationship? Are these things, okay, here's an easy way of putting it. I'm sorry, I'm just, I think I'm getting Alzheimer's, but oh, it's no. on both sides <laughs> of the gene pool. Um <laughs> You know, the reality is that um, we seem to have, you know, is this part of us? Is there no power to the normal? Is this just completely normal? Yes. And the way we've been conditioned and Indigenous yes. stories suppressed and religion monotheisms come in and sort of, you know, how do you see it? Well, that's that thing too. Exactly well, how I see it. Yeah, yes. when Wes says sometimes, do you think it was evil? Well, I don't know about because the evil is sort of like a, a, a Christian, you know, good and evil. It's like yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's that simple. It's like there's the yin and yang, absolutely the negative and the positive. But putting that connotation of it, it was evil. I, I think Sarah was on to something. Yes, yeah, so, no, but it's, <laughs> no, know, no, I agree with yeah. you. I, I, I absolutely um I, I agree with that too. Mm. I, I don't necessarily believe in in the in the Christian concept of, yeah, of no. evil. There's definitely mm. good and bad, and there are polarities. Absolutely. Yep, and there is that yin and yang. But we need both. We, mm-hmm. we we have to have both of those in order to have one. We have to have the other. Um, we 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 can't have just one without the other. No. Um, I do believe, and I I was brought up in the Catholic religion. I went mm. to Catholic schools. Um, I believe that. That has damaged me, and it's only now, as a fifty-year-old, uh, am I in the last few years of doing this and speaking to people who haven't been damaged by that conditioning, mm-hmm. who are in touch with this world, who who haven't had their that that thread and that connection disconnected. Um, I think religions have a lot to answer for when it comes to our inability to to see these beings, to connect Mm -hmm. with these beings, Mm -hmm. and our consequent feeling of absolute loneliness and isolation. Mm. Uh, You know, we we think we're the the only intelligent being in the universe. I mean, how it's not, that's not possible. There's all these other entities, Mm. races, things, beings out there, and I do believe our society has lost its way with regards to that connection. Mm. And I, what I do see a big shift happening at the moment is that we are reconnecting with that, with our spirits and where our spirits mm. connect with all the other spirits, all the other souls. Um, yep. I, so, I, yes, I, I, I agree with you there. Sometimes I get lost for words in trying to articulate that notion, but I think that, you know, all the animal life on the planet resonates and vibrates and has a sense of consciousness. Our relationship with our pets goes beyond emotionally, goes beyond that barrier of language and and therefore has a whole totally different way of being approached than you know, the neurological pathways that we've put up there. That are near, I mean, my wife's Greek has just such a better way of explaining certain <laughs> things, especially vitriolic <laughs> ways of, of human behaviour than English will ever have. But yes. I have this incredibly deep relationship with my cat. It's a very intuitive relationship. Mm. And I know that yes. Anthropologists now, zoologists are going, well, they have the same spectrum and depth of emotions that you do in your human consciousness. And so I think that this is all part of us. It has, you know, that's a supposition. It's an assumption. You mean we're all connected? But Well, not just connected. What we're seeing is as normal as the air we breathe. Mm. And we've, we've replaced this wonder with fear. Yeah because we tried to remove this notion. I think I'm reaching some philosophical point here, but I also think I'm losing it, Sarah. Please excuse me. (laughs) It has been such an absolute joy to spend some time in your company and share this conversation with you. Uh, That question about how do people, 
you know, able to cope with these experiences in their normal day life. What do you say to people that the, the multiple number of people that you've interviewed that you tell through the work and your empathy in your heart are actually suffering? What are some of the, the, the procedures you put into place or strategies you give them? Well, I certainly let everyone know that I believe them. Mm. I don't think you're cra- you're not crazy. Re- let me tell you, you're not crazy. I believe you. Because if I, you are, there's a lot of crazy people out there that have experienced this. So, yeah. Yeah, and and having worked in the mm. as a social worker, having worked with uh, in, in the in the work that I did in the city with with people with homeless people, there's a lot of mental health. Uh, mm. Sadly, a lot of mental health illnesses. Um, people with mental health illnesses often end up homeless. Uh, and yes. serious um, substance abuse issues. So uh, I can recognise when someone generally, when someone is actually in the throes of a, 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 of, of a, of a psychotic episode. Um, mm. And that doesn't look anything like no. the vast majority of people that I talk to. Yeah. Um, so, so my first, the first step is, is listening I always let someone tell their whole story and I say, tell it from in as much detail as you can from beginning to end and I won't interrupt you. I'll ask you some questions at the end, but just tell me the whole story. And so they get a chance to tell that whole story. There's no rush. They can tell it as slow or as fast as they like in as much detail as they like. And then I ask them questions after that so we maybe fossick around in their memory a little bit to, to, to pick out some of the details that they might have forgotten. Um, and I, I, and so by the time you've, you've had a conversation with someone that might last an hour and a half, two hours, uh, they feel that they've been heard, they've been believed, they've been able to share as much of that experience as, as they can. And as you mentioned before, Jamie, it is a very cathartic experience just being able to tell someone what happened to you um if that person i believe is really is is in need of uh ongoing sessions with someone to to unpack some of the impacts of it um i'm not a psychologist so i don't do ongoing counseling with anyone i'm not qualified to do that uh but i do re- then refer them to uh i have um at, at the moment i have three three people who are uh, social workers but with mental health specialists um, who I ref- and who are counsellors, qualified counsellors. Uh, so I can refer people to for ongoing counselling if they need it. Um, but, I, but I find that it's that basic thing of letting someone know you've heard them and that they aren't crazy and that you believe them. Um, I, I find the most important uh, procedures to go through with people. Um, so, yeah. Afterwards, I, I also remind people to be gentle with themselves and that they might, if, if, they're, if they're finding that they're having trouble sleeping, if they're having nightmares, if they're, um, if they're hypervigilant, you know, that, that where you're, you know, easily startled mm. and that a lot of that goes away, that does go away with time. Um, there are other things you can do in your home if you if you if you're frightened and you live in a bush area you can you can set up trail cameras on the outside of your house that generally makes them stay away if you're getting visitors and some people mm. do get regular visitors and they don't want them um, and are feeling quite frightened and they're f- afraid for their dogs and they're afraid for their livestock and they're afraid for their children um, or even sensor lights sensor lights and trail yep. cams the best mm-hmm. thing you can do yeah. Uh, do you, do you think there's a reality to the fact that there's a bit of fear for open spaces with them, that they don't like to be seen in that open space? Mm. They will stick yes. to the tree line? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so so st- stay in a clearing. Don't, don't yeah. go too far into dense bushland if you're, if you're afraid. Yeah. Uh, you, you know. And uh, what happens that- if you do come across them? What should you do? in that moment of absolute fear that you've now recognised that you're in the midst of something like this, what is the best procedural thing to do? Back away and leave. Slowly. Slowly back away, turn around and leave. And no eye contact. Remove that eye contact. No, best to avoid eye contact if you can. Mm -hmm. Um, but, But definitely back away slowly and leave. You need to pay attention to the signs. So if you, if you've, if you feel if you're feeling afraid, if you've got that 
that sense that a lot of people get where they have this feeling of dread. Uh, yeah. uh, and they're, they're suddenly afraid and they feel like they're being watched and they feel really frightened, but they're not sure why. Mm. That's a sign that yeah. you need to leave. That's, yeah. that's the yaoi either sending you, either emitting infrasound, mm-hmm. really low frequency sound that your inner ear is vibrating to and it's making you feel a bit nauseous, a bit anxious, a bit dizzy sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes a bit sleepy. Just some, you, there's something wrong and you know something's wrong but you're not sure what it is. That's the sign that you should turn around and leave. If the mm-hmm. forest around you falls silent, if there are no insect noises and no bird noises, time to skedaddle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, what are some of the other? If you if you get rocks thrown at you. Oh, that's, that's a big red flag. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes things, things start with little pebbles. So mm. people often report we got a few pebbles thrown at us and we just kept walking. So then the rocks get bigger. Yeah, and the, right. aim, the aim gets better and they get closer and closer to you. They could hit you with the rock if they wanted to. I mean, they, they're, they're obviously. Um, and that they're, very rarely happens. No, because they're not aiming at you. They're, they're, no. They want you to go away. They want you to go. They yeah. don't want you in their space. Either mm. they've got their family there, they've got their baby there, uh, they're hunting there. Uh, for whatever reason, you're, you've encroached in their territory mm-hmm. and you need to leave their territory. Yeah. So the best thing, you're generally not in danger. The best thing to do is to just calmly back away and then turn around and walk away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I do this all the time. When I'm out in the bush, I bushwalk a lot. Um, I talk to them all the time. So no, I, I say, hello, everyone. I'm here. I'm just walking my dogs. We won't be Making long. Making them Sorry. aware that you're there. Yeah, we won't be long. Um, and your tone also will register with them. Yep. They're really important factors. So I think it's important if you're deciding to go out there or if you've got a property close to what you think is activity, no going out and cooking the ribs in an open-air barbecue at midnight. <laughs> that could be trouble. Keep yep. some open space. And you know what? Tell people how they can get in touch and report these sightings because I think you're delivering a service that should actually be so honoured and should be government funded yeah. immediately and is not. And so the courage of you and Dean and that tr- team are astounding. So the catharsis of reporting these sightings and realising you're not alone, how do people go about that with you? Okay, so to, to report a Yowie sighting to... AYR to Australian Yowie Research. You can you can do it in two ways. You can go straight to our website, our yowiehunters.com. And on that main page, there's report, you can, there's a, a link to mm-hmm. report a sighting. So that's the we prefer it done that way because we can keep track of everybody. We get so many. Yeah, um, do. that it's much easier if everybody goes to the one place. So if mm-hmm. you put a report in via our website at yowiehunters.com. Um, then that is sent to Dean and Dean then forward, if it's a sighting, Dean then forwards it to me and I email you and get in touch and we have a chat. So if you, if you need me, if you need my support, you can get me through Australian Yowie Research or uh, you can contact me via Yowie uh, Central at gmail.com. Yowie Central at gmail.com. And I've got a Facebook group. In fact, we've got AYR and Yowie Central have, have Facebook groups that you can join. Um, but the best way uh, for a Yowie sighting so we can include it in our database and it's included as serious research is through the yowiehunters.com website. Now, can you it's please tell your family and your husband that we appreciate and yeah. adore who you are? Thank and you And we so believe much. that, that um, Nick Cave does not deserve a statue. Stop you it. do. <laughs> you know? and what's Nick Cave done that just remove all the black hair dye from Australia in hey, the last 20 years? If, any, if there are any any wealthy benefactors out there, who, who are philanthropists, who would like to donate to our cause, there's no money in Yowie Research. We do it for yeah, the love no. of it. We spend and that's probably one of the most important things. Job. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's we spend hours and hours and hours, yeah, uh, every every week. Um, so, got some funding would be fantastic. <laughs> and if people go online and just see your work, even small amounts of money can help. So, and they can actually send that money to you online. 
Uh, we do actually don't have anything set up like that. I keep telling you Dean need to, to set do up it. Like you Patreon. Need to well, if anybody switch. wants to send money, just get in yeah. contact with Sarah and she'll Well, we have okay. a donate I'll switch and it's pathetic. <laughs> you know. yeah. So I think you need to have that, but get in touch with them. They need assistance. They are not getting the funding they deserve and they've put in so much work in the field with such a valuable <laughs> job. Our heart is with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Give our respect and regards to the rest of the team, and we'll get back to you for more interviews in the future. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'd love. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. It was it's our been pleasure. It was actually, actually our pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, yep. definitely yep. my pleasure as well. I'd love to come back and have a chat. And oh, absolutely, great. I'm sure Dean and Gary and Buck and, and the rest of the team would be delighted to to have a chat to you about their, their field research as well. Fabulous. All right. We'll All right. speak in the future. And there's lots of exciting things we can do together. We've got 16 mil prints of in search of. We can do backyard screenings when we've got the ribs out. Awesome. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> Take That's care. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we will be back next week with another. Well, it's our last episode. Actually, it's for the last year. We're going to do a round We're going to do a roundup of yeah. the month. And but I just think I'll, I'll talk about Sarah about oh, how absolutely. astounding she is. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. We will be back next week. Uh, we much appreciate. Um, You've been on on told radio yeah. down south anomalies. Okay. With the incredible, Sarah. Mc- Okay, now I was going to do the intro again. Don't oh, my do God, that. we're all over the shop today because we're <laughs> so excited to yeah. be an extraordinary company. All right. Okay. Bye, kids. See bye. you next week. Bye.